Hey everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted a powerful second act or to reach the potential you always felt was inside, then do we have the Late Bloomer Show for you. Today I'll be talking with Rich Carlgaard, the publisher of Forbes, a renowned speaker and pilot, and the author of a brilliant must-read to rekindle your candle, Late Bloomers. And that's just what I want to talk with him about today, about the power of patience in a world obsessed with early achievement. That plus we'll talk about an A- in film aesthetics, Sports Illustrated and the Stacks, a Mickey Mouse curriculum, a security dog and a Ford Falcon, Myers and Briggs, Bits and Adams, the revenge of the nerds, what on earth is Harold, mom and zebras, and what in the world Iron Butt Bob and the ugly have to do with anything. So welcome to the show, Rich. Are you ready to shine? I'm ready to shine. Woohoo! All right, so before we dive right into things, let's address the madness. What's the message of societal madness that's trickling down today? The societal madness is the idea that, that we're, we, we society have constructed this conveyor belt to early achievement in school, and we're pressuring kids and teens and young adults as we never have before to demonstrate early achievement by way of of standardized test scores, 4.3 grades in uh, advanced placement courses, excellence in extracurricular activities, all with the goal of getting into the most elite college that you can, all with the goal of getting that first job at Google or Goldman Sachs or the, the most highly performing companies in the, the economy today. And the problem is we're measuring intelligence along a very narrow band Yes. of of the broad spectrum of human intelligence. So if you happen to be one of those kids who does very well sitting down in a, in a room and taking a standardized test, or you have the determined focus to get 4.3 grade averages today, because certainly 4.0 is not enough anymore, of course. then hallelujah, the, the system has discovered you. If you're the greatest latent carpenter in the world or a musician in the world, or you're a lateral thinker or a creative thinker, rather than this conveyor belt discovering your strengths, it's probably revealing your weaknesses because you're probably not that person who does exceptionally well on a standardized test or has the determination and focus to get a 4.3 grade average. And I think that's a travesty. It's contributed to this rising rates of, of anxiety, depression, and sadly suicide among teens and young adults. It's leaving people who don't do well in that system feeling like they're second-class citizens and will be for the rest of their lives. And the outrage is that neuroscience says quite the opposite about our ability to bloom and to rebloom throughout our entire lives. Thank you. And let's, let's actually go from there. Let's roll back the clock maybe to your favorite early years Grade school, what was it like for you before everything in your world changed? I had a great grade school life. I, I grew up in a, a small city, Bismarck, North Dakota, the capital of, of North Dakota. My dad was a physical education teacher and my mom a housewife. But you could live a middle class life uh, back then with those kind of jobs. My dad later became, uh, he got ambition uh, around the age of 40 and he yeah. bloomed and he became the athletic director of the public school systems, but that was not what he was when I grew up. But I had the usual small town kid experiences, riding my bike everywhere, riding my bike to the public swimming pool, getting um, putting a quarter down uh, to get a, a, an ice cream cone at Dairy Queen, maybe it was even 10 cents then, um, playing all kinds of sports, not for the excellence, not to put on my college application years later, but because it was it was fun hide-and-go-seek, um, throwing apples at cars as I got older in the fall when the apples were falling from the trees. Uh, it was ideal. And then To Kill a Mockingbird came along. Yeah, adolescence came along. And suddenly all of my friends physically matured and their interests changed. Yep. Uh, their hormones kicked in, and I was still a kid. In eighth grade, I was five foot two and 80 pounds. And my confidence was shot. 
I went out for football and I was the scrawniest kid on the junior high team. And I, and basically I played safety, but only in practice. So the starting team could hit me and hit me again. I remember uh, once um, in uh, when I was in eighth grade, a ninth grader after school took a swing at me and, and broke my glasses in front of a bunch of kids. And it was a great humiliation. And so I spent the years roughly from age 12 to 25 in more or less of a depression with a huge or I mean, with a with a small number of high spots. I went out for track and cross country in high school, and that's a great place for a skinny stoic like me to vent their anger because uh, being a good distance runner is all about being able to channel pain and being able to tolerate pain. And I became fairly good at that. Um, after high school, I graduated with about a 3.2 average. All I know is that I barely made the honor roll, and the honor roll was top 20%. So I was probably hovering around 18 or 19. I think I graduated somewhere in the 90s in my class of 500 plus at Bismarck High School. And um, not knowing what I wanted to do, I went off to the local junior college three blocks from my house. And I began to develop a little bit there. I ran track and cross country. I won a few races. And then I fooled the admissions director at Stanford into admitted admitting me. But I want to stop here and say that Stanford in the 70s was a far different place than today. Mm -hmm. It was an up and coming regional university. Today, it's world class. It admitted about 25% of the students. They admitted an even higher percentage of junior college transfers to accommodate all the all the community college graduates in California. Again, much more regional thinking then. They had a lot of slots for people from small states like myself. And then the one other thing that probably pushed me over into getting accepted when I when I clearly wasn't Stanford worthy was that the track and cross country coach saw that I'd run in the indoor nationals in junior college. And he misinterpreted a, a time of mine that was run in yards and thought it was in meters. So he instantly made me 10 percent faster than I really was. So I can imagine the discussion in the admissions department. Hey, you know, Coach Clark needs a, you know, he needs some cannon fodder on his cross country team, no scholarships. But we have this guy from North Dakota check that box. And uh, and and I slipped through the cracks that way. No briberies occurred, you know, <laughs> as they do today. And and I got to Stanford. And sure enough, uh, I was a terrible student there. I signed up on registration day and I was intimidated. I didn't know what to do. And I followed big bruising people around who looked like they were football players, figuring that they got in, not for their academic prowess either. Yeah. And, and, and at Stanford, it was nicknamed the Mickey Mouse curriculum. Um, Stanford, even back then, was very strong in engineering and its graduate schools was very good. But the liberal arts curriculum had both challenging classes and Mickey Mouse classes, human sex, uh, sleep and dreams, and film aesthetics. So I took classes like that. The challenging courses that I actually took, like an undergraduate class in constitutional law, I utterly bombed. I mean, I quit. I was headed for a C or a D, so I, I, I bombed. So that's I took the easier, softer path through Stanford. And at the end of that, while my... Um, College roommates were going off to law school, uh, an advanced degree in chemical engineering at Penn. One went off to Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena uh, to get a joint uh, a divinity degree and a clinical psychology degree. At age 25, I was no more capable of holding a serious job th than that of security guard, dishwasher, and temp typist. So that was me at age 25. I remember my low moment. Yeah. At age 25, was a, I was a security guard. I w was uh, it was a it was a graveyard shift at a rent a truck yard in San Jose, and I was making my rounds the perimeter of the fence. I'm dressed up like a mall cop. I've got something called a DTEX clock with a key, and you would key these stations along the fence to prove that you'd made your rounds every hour. And I heard a barking, and it was an angry barking. And I swung my flashlight around, and there through a chain link fence in another yard was a Rottweiler. And I looked at him and he looked at me and, and he, he looked at me with anger and I looked at him with puzzlement. And, and, then, and then I figured out that at age 25, my professional colleague 
was a dog. And months later, Steve Jobs, also 25, would take Apple public. Mm -hmm. So that was the gulf between me, who hadn't bloomed whatsoever, and, uh, and Steve Jobs, who was a magnificent early bloomer. And by the way, a re-bloomer when he came back to Apple in his 40s. When I, I uh, before I went to college, and I really went to college to learn how to race bicycles, and I went and raced in Europe for a few years, tried to wow. make it to the tour. Um, I said that before college, I worked for minimum wage at a sporting goods department store. And after my racing career was over, I got hit by a car in the French Alps a few years in. I said that after college, I was now working for near minimum wage in a sporting goods department store. I, I had the political science degree. I tried to make a minor in exercise physiology. My brain, my executive functions hadn't woken up yet. So, oh, go ahead. Go for it. Oh, yeah. Well, first of all, congratulations that you went for it at the highest levels of cycling. And no wonder you're in Aspen. Uh, Colorado is such a such a center of all the great cycling. And yeah. and uh, you probably trained with Chris Carmichael and people like I that. I did train with Chris. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. I mean, fantastic. I, I wanted to be in distance running what you wanted to be in cycling, but I never got that far. Anyway, yeah, back to back to my middle 20s. And, and I described this period of 12 to 25 when I wasn't blossoming at all, except for little, you know, a few little peaks along the way. Well, it was through a temp typing job at age 26 that I ended up at a company called the Electric Power Research Institute in Palo Alto. Yeah. And they had a shower facility and they were located in the Palo Alto Hills. And so at noon, some of the people would go out for a three or four or five mile run. Yeah. And I joined them and I was beginning to clean up my act. I had stopped smoking pot. Um, I wasn't doing things as I did when I was a security guard. And, and uh, for a while, I was a security guard at a winery. And, and all I can say is, there was a curious uh, missing of inventory oh that coincided God. with the time that I did my spots. So I was beginning to clean up my act physically a bit, and I started running with these fellows. And one of them said, why are you in the temp typing pool? And I almost broke down. And I said, I really don't know why. I'm, I'm confused. I feel ashamed, ashamed that I'm, uh, I'm still stuck because I know I'm capable of more. I don't know what that would be. And they <clears throat> they offered me a job to be a um, a uh, an editor and, and writer, uh, editing technical journals mm -hmm. and papers. And I was really good at it. My brain woke up. I was ready to accept that job. I didn't mention that al along the way when I was the security guard, a lot of my posts were ones where I came in at 5 p.m., relieved the receptionist and worked till midnight. And that gave me a lot of time to read. And so I was reading then, and I was reading uh, sports magazines, I was reading popular novels, but I was also reading serious novels like Saul Bellow's Humboldt's Gift. Let me back and you up for that, one second. I yeah, want to back you up yeah. for one second, because yeah, yeah. it's great, particularly when we're talking about late bloomers. If we can go back, the cover of your book, which I think is brilliant, which has all these, all these uh, points, dots, period marks, whatever we want to call them on there, dot, dot, ellipses. dot. Ellipses. Ellipses. It has yeah. all these ellipses on there. And... What occurs to me is all of these ellipses, all of these points in our lives that we think are wasted, that we think we, we wasted our time doing it, and that they're for naught are anything but, because you were in the stacks at Stanford, you've got Iron Butt Bob, your roommate, who goes on to, to law school and beyond, who can sit in the stacks for hours. You're busy there, in, in, engrossed in Sports Illustrated, which we think at the time is just wasting your life, but turns out to be the thread that now carries forth. Now you're excited. You're reading when you're doing supposed to be doing security work. And here comes along your reading and writing jobs. And we find out that everything from before that seemed like it was a waste was meaningful. Well, thank you for bringing that up. Yes, I had a roommate, Bod, who was focused and early achiever, collegiate volleyball player. He could park his butt down at a study carol and for four hours drinking Pepsi. I don't even know how he held a whole <laughs> quart of Pepsi without getting up and having to take a pee, but he could. And then he'd come back and write a 40-page 
double space paper and then uh, maybe the next day type it up. That was Bob, and he went on to be a great lawyer. And I thought I thought the secret of being Bob mm -hmm. was to buy the same brand of backpack, yellow highlighters, and so on. And so I'd go, I'd walk with Bob to to the Stanford undergraduate library, nicknamed Ugly. Bob would sit down at his study carol. I'd sit down at his study carol. He'd take out his backpack. I'd take out my backpack, etc. Except that after about a half hour, I was fidgeting and and uh, and I would get up and I seemed to be drawn to the the stacks of hardbound magazines. Mm -hmm. I particularly love Sports Illustrated. I read every issue of Sports Illustrated from its inception year in 1954 through the present. And I began to notice things. And this is what you talk about. You're learning things even when you don't, you don't think you're learning things. I began to notice great writing, great caption writing, great headline writing, mm -hmm. um, great photography, great illustration. I mean, they had the best caricaturists in the world. Nobody could show... The, the nerves of a golfer trying to make a six foot downhill curvy putt to win a major than a caricaturist could. And I was absorbing these things and, uh, and, and later would come out with a spectacular good use. So now you fast forward uh, 25, you know, many of my security guard posts, I'm reading, uh, I'm reading thriller novels. Yeah. I'm reading political journals across the ideological spectrum. I'm reading, uh, serious novels like Saul Bellow's Humble Gift, I remember, which uh, tipped o Be Bellow. It was the novel after a distinguished career that tipped him over into winning the Nobel Prize in Literature a uh, year after he wrote it. And I was absorbing things. It wasn't doing me any good in, in time. So then when I finally got the job to uh, try out for a, a technical editor, and technical writer, I now knew how to construct readable sentences. I now knew how to construct readable paragraphs. Yeah. I now knew how to take engineering ease and turn it into something readable without destroying the thing that made it good, which is the scientific basis of whatever the engineer was writing about. And my career began to take off two years before. I think I would have blown it because I still didn't have that executive functioning. I still would have done something stupidly self-destructive. I didn't include in the book. I had about a, a one-month stint at another research firm a couple of years before. And we had a client meeting, and I got to attend my first client meeting with a paying client to this research firm. And we're going around the room and introducing each other. It came to me, and I said, uh, my name is Richards, Keith Richards, who's, of course, guitarist for the Rolling Stones. Afterward, my boss said, what the hell were you thinking when you said that? And uh, I said, I don't know. The meeting seemed kind of boring. It's not boring. It's business. And uh, not long after that, I was let go. I didn't even know enough to know that I shouldn't have done that. And so when I finally got the chance to be a technical writer and editor at age 26, everything began to fall in place. And so uh, that's why I say these ellipses represent the things. I'm so glad you figured that out of the things that, that were accumulating along the way. I was able to put my, um, my Sports Illustrated Study. I had a master's in Sports Illustrated, if you look at it that way. And when we had in the bicycle late 80s, racing. Yeah. When in the late 80s, I had the opportunity with a friend to start Silicon Valley's first business magazine. Mm -hmm. And I was the editor and designer. And I said, well, what should it look like? Gosh, I still thought business is boring. I no longer call myself Keith Richards. Uh, but but I still thought business is kind of boring. And I thought, it's it's got to have the verb. Business is a competitive sport. Um, sports is a competitive sport. It's got to have that urgency and that feeling of fun of what it must be like on the inside. And the one thing that we couldn't have was photography because business never lets you in. It, how do you capture a pivotal moment in a business like you might in cycling when you have a breakaway or somebody, uh, somebody hauling someone down on Alpe d'Huez or some you know, magical moment like that? Well, you don't have them. So you have to recreate them through illustration. And I knew I could do that because of what I'd learned through reading Sports Illustrated. And it was a big hit. Uh, within two years, everybody in Silicon Valley and tech communities paying attention to us. Bill Gates gave me four hours of in interviews, probably because he didn't want to be caricatured. I don't know. But uh, they, uh, I had the feeling they did it defensively. Mm -hmm. And then magazines like Forbes and Fortune began to look into us 
with the idea of buying us because they said, who the hell is this little magazine out in Silicon Valley that is able to get Bill Gates to sit down for four hours of interviews? And it was us. So Steve Forbes um, hired me, and right from the get-go at Forbes, in my mid-30s, I was reporting straight to him. So in a 10-year period, I went from being a pathetic security guard whose professional colleague was a dog to reporting to Steve Forbes because everything began to come together, but they become, be, only began to come together in my late 20s. So let's talk about what, what took place there. But before we do that, it seems like you've continuously evolved and challenged yourself. And I've got to bring this one up. I think about it all the time. It's someday in my future. And that someday will probably come. But at 46, you decided, let's learn how to fly a plane. Well, a lot of it, for the first time in my life, uh, I described growing up, my dad was a physical education teacher. I mean, we lived a solidly middle class existence in Bismarck, and my younger siblings would live a better one. But there was no money for things like flying or things, stuff like that. And all of a sudden, Thanksgiving 1999, I don't know what compelled me, but but I was in the magazine stacks of a bookstore, and I picked up an issue of flying. Mm -hmm. And I said, I got to I got to do that. I got to try that. And, and thus began a process where I took up flying. I uh, got my private pilots in 2001, instrument in 2002, flew around the country after I got my instrument certification in a, in a little Cessna 172 that I bought, kind of the Toyota Camry of the skies. And um, I was interested, this is after the dot-com crash, and I wondered what, uh, Silicon Valley was in a black mood then, and I decided I would use this plane to get outside of Silicon Valley mm -hmm. and discover entrepreneurs who were doing really cool technology things outside of Silicon Valley. I mean, that's where I met Doug Bergam, who created a software company called Great Plains, and many other, uh, many other entrepreneurs like that. Great Plains, by the way, was in Fargo, North Dakota. And so it was, it was wonderful. I, I just love, I love to fly. I'm so busy with this late bloomers project that I've had to put it inside. Because Lake Bloomers is now is the mission I feel like the rest of my life that I must dedicate myself to because of the pain out there and the opportunity not even seen for millions of people. Let's dive right into that. What is your mission? Why is it so important? And then what's happening out there in the world and particularly in the job market today? Well, I think that 2008 and 2009 recession really spooked us, uh, and particularly for millennials and Gen Zs and parents of millennials and Gen Zs. I mean, these poor millennials, first of all, we put them on this conveyor belt to early achievement that is subject them to more pressure for early achievement than any other generation has been. And then because we're struggling, they, we call them snowflakes. I mean, that, that just, that, that to me is an outrage. But they also, so they, they went to school. I mean, every, uh, people who criticize the millennials talk about, well, yeah, in grade school, everybody got a trophy and all of that. That's just like mouse nuts compared to stepping back and looking at the big picture. Yeah. And the big picture is we subject them to more pressures about early achievement. And then you have social media. So it, it's not enough that they're comparing themselves with their, 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 their grades and their test scores are comparing themselves with their, the curated lives of their peers. And then they come into a job market that is really pretty tough after the 2008 and 2009 recession. And the only reliable area of economic growth in that period of time, sure, there are little, pot, you know, little spots of entrepreneurship here and there, yeah. but the two big reliable ones have been in technology, particularly software and the internet, and in high-end financial services. Well, what do companies like Google, Google and Goldman Sachs want? What do venture capitalists in Silicon Valley want? What do the hedge funds want? They want somebody who's algorithmically gifted. How do you prove that algorithmic giftedness? Well, 800 on your math SAT kind of hints at it pretty strongly. The fact you got into MIT hints at it strongly. You, we don't care if you necessarily finished MIT. In fact, the fact that you might have dropped out might tell us that you've got the entrepreneur's gene. But when you look at the two dominant parts of the economy, or where the, all the, the economic growth and, and super wealth has been created, and with examples like Mark Zuckerberg or 
Sergey Brin and Larry Page at Google, you go, it's, it's trickled down into the school system, particularly in high performance cities like uh, the San Francisco Bay Area, Seattle, New York City, um, the affluent suburbs around uh, Denver, the kinds of people who have homes in Aspen. And it's like, this is the track that our kids must follow to have any, you know, to have the best possible chance that they will be able to have as good a life as we have had, or in any case, not worse. And it's the fear of social status, I think, that is driving these high achievement, upper middle class parents to push their kids in a way that they themselves probably weren't pushed. And that is creating all the kind of dysfunctions that I talked about when it comes to anxiety, depression, and suicide. Um, what really prompted me to write this book, when I said, I have to get off my ass and make this the mission of my life and share my own stories, however embarrassing. When it was word starting to get around in Silicon Valley of all these, um, this epidemic of high school suicides and suicide ideation. And sure enough, Atlantic Monthly came along, did a cover story in late 2015 called the Silicon Valley Suicides. And what was remarkable about them is that the kids who were taking their lives or were expressing suicide ideations, ideation weren't the, 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 the crappy students. They were the near great students. They were the merely B plus and A minus students who felt like they were inferior compared to the ones that were on a fast track to Stanford and Harvard, et cetera. Uh, what, what one kid um, had, had posted up until his death on social media, that he was exhausted from getting up at 3.30 in the morning to keep up with his AP classes. And then, and then every, I was getting all this validating feedback when I started the research process for late bloomers, which took five years, by the way, or four years. And I interviewed Carol Dweck. Now, Carol Dweck's a wonderful human being. Minds, you're not in your head. You probably read Mindset. Mindset is one of the one of the important books to read. You know why it's better to have a growth mindset rather than a fixed mindset. Sometimes it's the early achievers, that, like John McEnroe, the tennis player, that trap themselves with a fixed mindset. Mm -hmm. I would say that probably happened to Elizabeth Holmes at Theranos too. Yep. But she said, I interviewed Carol and I said, um, tell me what's changed since you wrote Mindset in 2006. And she leaned across the table and she said, the students I'm seeing at Stanford today are more in exhausted and even brittle than at any time that I've seen. What do you mean by that? She said, they don't want to mar their perfect records. They should be jumping up and down for joy that they got into Stanford, an Ivy League school in a country club atmosphere. And they're feeling like, uh-oh, they're only going to hold me to more expectations. Something is wrong with that, uh, Michael. You, you talk about it, you give a quote in the book about a 10th grader who's saying, I need to be in the top 4% to be accepted to such and such, such and such. I can't be experimenting with classes anymore. I have to just take the ones that are going to give me the A's. And, you know, I'm blown away by the three and four year olds who they're spending ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars to for the competitive nursery schools. And then at 10th grade to say, no, I have to say on a fixed path, it's time for me to. And this is something I used to coach. Uh, kids and adults with learning disabilities and attention deficit disorder. And their parents would say of elementary and jewelry school, junior high school kids, my son, my daughter needs to buckle down now. It's time to get serious. They're yeah. just kids. Yeah. Um, well, that 10 year old, that was Megan McArdle. And I was quoting her from her story in the Washington Post about that. She's Megan McArdle's doing great work. ADHD, you mentioned. Yes. 94. Four or five percent of all prescriptions for ADHD, Ritalin and the like, are given in the United States. How are we biologically different? We're not. You know, we've turned into a clinical disease, you know, a little kid's inability to sit still in school. And then, uh, you know, 10th graders, um, you know, there, there's a there's a high priced uh, college admissions counselor operating in the L.A. suburbs that one of my colleagues at Forbes mentioned, who's telling parents, imagine this, your kids aren't going to see daylight for two years. You know, they've got to sit down. I mean, good Lord. I mean, you think about what that's going to do to their physical health. Yeah. Let, let, you know, let alone to their emotional health, let alone they're saying trade your, trade your curiosity mm -hmm. for a determined focus and uh, I think it's, it's just borderline criminal behavior in my mind. 
So let's let's jump from there and let's talk about because I want to get to to our audience who's going. How can I make this shift myself? What are the positives that's going on? Maybe about executive functioning around age twenty five. It's something that car rental companies have known for decades. Yeah. Well, the prefrontal cortex, uh, you know, which uh, ex- sits in one side of our brain, high over one of our uh, one of our eyes is really the seat of what psychologists call executive functioning. Until you have full maturity of the prefrontal cortex, it's hard to be mature now uh, and comport yourself like an adult. Now, when I say age 25, it's a bell curve. So some people will have full prefrontal cortex maturity earlier, some like me in their late 20s, some it may be even in their 30s. And then the most amazing thing happens after that. According to a maverick neuropsychologist out of NYU named O'Connor Goldberg, only after that happens do we get this flowering of neural networks that that allow the two sides of our brain, the right and left hemispheres, to communicate, the intuitive side, the logical side, to shorthand those. So all the recent research uh, from Jeffrey Arnett's, uh, he's a psychologist who posited that 18 to 25, or make it 28 if you want in your case, that they form a period of life that is not distinctly adolescence nor fully adult. And now we know why from a neurological sense. A 2015 study uh, by Harvard, MIT, and Massachusetts General Hospital, led by a woman named Laura Germain, asked the question, at what age do we cognitively peak? Because of all this fear in a technology-driven world that it's it tilts things toward those young algorithmic skills. Well, it depends on what cognitive ability you're talking about. Sure enough, rapid processing speed, working memory, they peak in our teens and 20s. But then a whole set of um, attributes, uh, neurological skills, come, into, come to blossom in our 30s, 40s, and 50s and support this idea that we'll be, uh, we're better executives, better managers, better deep pattern thinkers, um, better communicators. We have more compassion and empathy. And then in our 50s, 60s, and 70s, our brain continues to evolve toward that that thing we call wisdom, which Dr. Goldberg at NYU believes is this continuing wisdom is essentially the two sides of the brain working on something where there's a a little bit of a debate going between uh, uh, one side and the other, and it pops out as an intuition. And in the case of Dr. Goldberg, he's 72, he, he feels himself smarter at age 72 because he's able to short circuit the logical way of reaching a conclusion on something. And he finds that his intuitions at age 72 have never been better. Now that makes complete and total sense to me. I'm in my upper forties. I read a book a day now for this job. And, and I don't say that to tout that or anything, uh, but I was the ADD kid. In fact, I ended up writing a book for college students with ADHD many years later who would bounce around my seat and couldn't put two ideas together. I was sharp, but I was so wanted to be out, wanted to be playing, wanted to be running, wanting to be cycling. And now the brain has lit up. And you talk about this. A hitch you were a like, normal, healthy kid and young adult. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> you, and you blossomed magnificently. Thank you. Well, you talk about this. One of the keys that it takes, and then I want to get into the six strengths of the late bloomers, is we have to throw out the conveyor belt. We have to throw out the concept that it's only for them. And in fact, I've had on here Dr. Michael Merzenich several times, your neck of the woods, the uh, father of brain plasticity, who talks about that you can get smarter at any age. I go, if is it really true? that only the kids get smarter. And he goes, nothing could be further from the truth. But we need to throw out the old paradigm and use it, don't we? Yeah. I When I set out to write Late Bloomers, um, I was both, you know, I, I both thought it would be a way of making use of my early humbling and, and even uh, self-shamed start in life. I could make some use of it and help somebody. And particularly in this time when we had kids that were getting mentally ill because of the pressures. Well, I assumed that being a late bloomer was was um, you were falling behind on the conveyor belt. So you'd call a timeout. You would assess yourself. You would try to maneuver yourself into better spaces, perhaps, and then get back on the conveyor belt. And that wasn't what I found at all. To be a late bloomer, you have to get off the layer 
conveyor belt. You have to declare your declaration of independence from the conveyor belt. And you have to support yourself with friends and peers and family and whoever it is that supports your doing that. It's a lot easier if you have that. And then you have to begin a journey of discovery. And that's what late blooming is all about. Not, not just an aimless wander. It's a, it's a wandering with intent. It's, a, it's, a, it's finding the pathways out there. And then uh, I define late blooming because I was kind of surprised mm-hmm. that uh, there is no clinical definition of a late bloomer or late blooming. In fact, to the degree it shows up in, in psychology journals, it's almost always a problem <laughs> because our society sees it today as a problem. In fact, there's one, uh, I know a psychologist is about to give a speech, yeah. and I think he's got it right. He said, uh, slacker or late bloomer. And he's trying to move people more toward this late blooming idea. Your kids aren't slackers. They could possibly late, be late bloomers or simply paralyzed and depressed because they don't know they can be late bloomers. But yeah, can we get smarter at any edge? Of course we can. Uh, I, it, may, it might be a little bit different kind of intelligence. It might not be that narrow band of algorithmically focused intelligence, which the young seem to do better. But it, cr- take creative insight. Are, are kids more creative, young people more creative, or do we actually have more creativity when we're older? Well, we probably have more raw creativity, more novel perceptions. Wow. I've never seen that before when we're young because we don't have the repository of stored memories. But according to Dr. Goldberg of NYU, and and, and this shows up in many of the people I wrote about, they continue to have really brilliant creative insights in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and beyond. And a creative insight, or what I like to think of as creative yield, you have a higher creative yield, so your numerator of creative insights may not be as much as they were when you're young. But your ability to perceive something novel and then have that travel to the other side of the brain and do go, something. What can I make of this? Is this useful or not? Is this just sort of fun and ephemeral? Or or could it actually unlock something my mind has been working on yeah. for a long time? And that's what that's creative yield. So a great example of that, John Goodenough. Oh, John Goodenough. Uh, John Goodenough invented the cell phone or got, took out the patent for the cell phone or, or the lithium ion battery, which powers everything from the cell phone to Tesla cars today at age 57, 57 uh, for that kind of a big insight. But he wasn't done in his 90s. He filed a new patent for a new kind of uh, cell phone that would go from chemical to solid state. And we'll see if it takes off in the marketplace. You know, the people at the Tesla Gigafactory mm-hmm. in, uh, in Nevada uh, is sort of the Manhattan project of, uh, of getting batteries to the next generation. So I don't know if Goodenough's new project will really take off. But the fact that Goodenough in his 90s, not in a retirement home, but working along, alongside of colleagues and grad students at the University of Texas in Austin, still, still bringing it, you know, in his 90s is very encouraging. What, and, and this was a question, my wife, she's the producer, we were talking about your book and bouncing it back and forth afterwards, and we were, we were talking specifically about the, the market segment of women either 50 and above or 55 and above being this, this lost generation of can't get jobs now. How important is it when we're stepping off the conveyor belt to keep up with the tech a- edge, or is that not necessary? It's much more empower- important for be, us to be out of these paradigms. Well, I think it's a national scandal that we have all that talent out there that is parents, but largely women, who who bore children and then raised the children and stepped out of the workforce and come back, and despite their immense talents, uh, have a hard time getting back in. I'll describe the story of, of Carol Fishman Cohen. Sure. Uh, Carol Fishman Cohen went to Pomona College in California. She was the valedictorian uh student class president. Uh, She went to Harvard Business School, and then she got a job at an investment bank in Los Angeles and made partner before the age of 30. Doesn't sound like a late bloomer to me. Sounds like a paradigm of an early bloomer. Mm -hmm. But then she stopped out and had four children. And then when she came back into the workforce, she was shocked and then demoralized and then later described herself as being shattered 
that nobody nobody wanted her. She was having a very difficult time getting into the rhythm and the groove of investment banking after stepping out for only 12 years. And the, the kind of sad detail about that, it wasn't she'd lost any knowledge about finance. She was still reading Barron's in the Wall Street Journal and stuff like that when she was feeding her children. It was the little stuff. It was workflow apps. It was that she no longer had an executive assistant and had to do her own PowerPoints. Now, that sounds like whining, but she didn't mean it as whining at all. She meant that that, that it, it, it seemed like a barrier that, that was hard to overcome. And she figured, well, uh, if I'm feeling this, other women must be feeling it too. And so she started a company in Cambridge, Massachusetts called iRelaunch, which helps women coming back into the workforce, not women, you know, parents, anybody who took time out. Maybe it was to take care of their own parents uh, or somebody who was uh, seriously ill in the family. But the time out people who are coming back in and, um, and and these are kind of springing up around the country now. And it's a very, very welcome development. But I think that HR has dropped the ball in this uh, among employers. They um, I think they want to do it. I've never heard of any. I've never talked to anybody who didn't want to do that, create e easier paths for people to come in. But it's the screening. It's the algorithmic. Here we go. Once again, the algorithmic data driven screening that occurs so that this woman coming back into the workforce after 12 years of motherhood gets screened out because there's somebody out there who's roughly equivalent to her who didn't. And never mind the fact that this woman probably picked up amazing executive skills, negotiating skills, all the things you pick up as a parent. So I think we now need a revolution uh, among employers on that and also with older employees too. It's interesting. We had uh, on uh, Mo Gaudat of uh, Google X several times recently. We're talking about artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence now being the engine that runs a lot of the uh, online decision-making software for will this person get an interview or not. And, and it sounds like there's some major tweaking that needs it. That's in order. Oh, here you go once again. You asked about some of the later blooming skills and I had a chapter called The, the, the Six Strengths of of, uh, Let's late go into bloomers. those. Yes. Yeah, uh, because because I want to make the point at the beginning, and then the point later on, uh, just to connect with our last line of thought here, is these don't show up on algorithms. They are revealed, but they're probably inferred by other things that you're doing. But right now they're revealed, not tested for, and therefore they're missed. But you take. One of them, I let off with curiosity. Mm -hmm. Now we can't, science can't tell us whether late bloomers are more curious than, than early bloomers, but we can look at the anecdotal evidence out there. We know that late bloomers hang on to their childish behavior later. And like those ellipses in the cover, dot, 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 when we were curious, we were discovering things and learning things and, and stuff like that which in my case, I was able to put to good use once I got into writing and, and magazines, but, but it was hurting my grades in real time when it was happening. And curios what's so great about curiosity is that it's the gift that keeps on giving. It really is the seed of innovation. You can't be innovative. You can't find your life's path, what you were meant to do, that intersection of deepest talents and deepest purpose, until... You are curious about what would that path, what would those paths look like and what would it look like? You have to get on that path. Here again, we get to the disconnect between what employers say they want and, and what, what the HR people are screening for. A 2017 cover story in Fortune magazine, their annual best places to work list, mm -hmm. asked some big name CEOs, the CEO of Intuit, the CEO of Genentech, among others, what do you want most in your employees? The number one word was curiosity. And I felt like jumping through the ether and throttling them and saying, well, your company sure as hell doesn't screen for them. Yeah. You know, their initial screen is for grades and test scores and demonstration of early algorithmic excellence or uh, technical ability along a narrow track. There's no reason to believe that those people have any more curiosity than the late bloomer and every reason to believe that they may have less when you listen to what Carol Dweck is saying mm -hmm. and others are saying. Compassion is a, is a late bloomer's strength. Compassion is more than empathy. 
Empathy is a feeling. Compassion is you're willing to do something about it. You're willing, to, when you see suffering, you're willing to do something about it. When you see a colleague at work that's suffering, you don't take advantage of that colleague. You're willing to help them. And ultimately, there are, there are examples to the contrary, all too many, sadly. But ultimately, is the compassionate leader that people will flock to. And if you're in any kind of interest, industry where you're battling for talent, you want to be the company where people flock to, not drive them away. I know there are examples, let's just say cough, cough in politics and, and business today, where it, doesn't, where it seems like compassion is for suckers, but it isn't. Uh, resilience, that ability to get off, uh, you know, get knocked down and get back up. I would say that late bloomers have more experience at doing that. So they're less brittle. I go back to Carol Dweck. I, the kids I'm seeing today, they're exhausted and brittle. Well, if you're brittle and you take a punch, you shatter. If you're resilient and take a punch, you go, well, that wasn't any fun. You know, I'll get back up and ask myself what I learned uh, learned about that. Equanimity. Equanimity is the ability to stay calm under pressure. Captain Sullenberger landed uh, the U.S. airplane in the Hudson. Uh, perfect. Everybody got out. He was 58 when he did it. Uh, more recently, about a year ago, uh, Tammy Jo Schultz, the Southwest Airlines pilot who was flying toward Philadelphia, 31,000 feet, an engine blew up, shrapnel went through a window, killed a passenger, blood to screaming and vomiting everywhere. And she landed the plane very safely, calmly, listened to the air traffic control recording, and she's as calm and fact-based as could be. She was 56. And then lastly, uh, this quality that we call wisdom. Now, wisdom, wisdom sort of leads into this category, if I might, about what do you do with older employees that uh, inside of your organization that are perfectly willing to work, but maybe not 50 or 60 hours, weeks anymore, jump on a plane at moment's notice. What do we do with them? And I think we need to, this gets to this wisdom thing. They are wise. Mm -hmm. They've accumulated a lot of practical wisdom about how things work around the organization and how to get things done in the outside world. But if you have an up and out career track, that is, you, you keep promoting people and giving them pay raises till some point, depending on the industry, 40s, 50s, 60s, the finance people say, my God, we're paying that person a lot of money and we've got to make room for the up and coming talent below them. Otherwise, we'll lose that up and coming talent. What are we to do with these people? And up and out says, OK, you've, you've had your run. You're out. Sorry, you made a great contribution, but, but we're retiring you. Mandatory retirement age around here is 55 or 60, and that's the way we do it around here. And what a loss. It's, again, like these women you know, who went out to be mothers. What a loss of, of talent. What if we could construct, a, a, instead of up and out, a career arc so we could have older employees that everybody realizes, everybody knows, including the employee themselves, has peaked in terms of their willingness to work long hours, uh, peaked in terms of their paycheck. Let's have a negotiation. Let's negotiate what the coach and mentor period of your career would look like. Maybe awesome. you give up half your salary. Maybe you, uh, you're you going to work 30 hours a week. You will coach the Gen Xers, the Millennials, and the Gen Zs to be better than they are. That's your new task. You give up the EVP title, and we're going to call you senior coach, uh, counselor, all of those things. I bet there are a lot of older employees that say, I'd love to do that, and that perfectly suits where I am in my career in my mid-60s and beyond. My mother-in-law just retired. She's in the other room at the moment visiting us for a couple weeks. She just retired at, at 71. She was doing a job that, that no three people could do, but they didn't move her into a training role. They just said, can you stay longer and do this more? And at that point, she's saying the pressure is just not worth it. They hadn't fully realized or utilized, as you're saying, the skills that she had so that she could train a new gen. Yeah, absolutely. Make it very clear. Have an honest, open negotiation. That that job at 30 hours a week, uh, depending on where you came from at your peak, it might be two thirds of your salary. It might be half your salary. If you were in the C-suite, it might be a quarter of your salary. Um, but there should be some open negotiation. When I talk to lawyers and HR people, they live in fear of a, of a good negotiation 
agreed to gone bad later when the employee that negotiated it on the downside of the slope, a, a coaching position, then comes back and files an age discrimination lawsuit against them. And that's sad. But I would say it's not insurmountable. we got to work our way around that because simply going up and out, leaving all that talent out there is, is a bigger mistake. Thank you. Let's talk about two more key topics and we'll begin to wrap this down. I'm, I'm, I'm loving this, Rich. I'm absolutely loving it. First off. You're a great host, Michael. You're, you put people at ease and yeah. Thank you, well, Rich. You, I feel you, you have a piece about you, obviously, and you know how to bring that piece to you and it comes through and I, I feel joy and at peace when I'm talking with you. Thank you, thank you. It's it's quite enjoyable to speak with you as well, and and you're you're both living this, and you can draw in from all of these areas. So you're very easy to interview because I I'm always watching my curveballs, trying to make it easy for my guest. But I know if I just drop you in there, you'll pull out the name, you'll pull out the reference, and you'll be able to run with it. So on that note, we're gonna go we're gonna go from was it was it we're talking about some of the huge positives here. And then let's talk about something that uh, the old adage, tell me if this is true, winners never quit and quitters never win. Well, that's, that's the popular feeling in the United States. Uh, that's part of uh, a staple of pop psychology. It, it leads to an overinterpretation of Angela Duckworth's great work about grit. Mm -hmm. um, well, if, if winners never quit, how do you explain Richard Branson? Because he quit Virgin Cola, he quit Virgin Brides. He's quit a lot of businesses that simply didn't work. How do you explain Intel quitting the memory chip business in the 80s to bet it all on the microprocessor? I think at any point in time, there's an optimal use of our time, mm -hmm. our talent, our purpose, and our treasure. That is what we're willing to invest in. And if we're investing suboptimally in all of those, we ought to think about, well, maybe there's a better way. You know, if a military general decides that a battle is hopeless and they strategically retreat, we don't call them a quitter. Maybe some of the trolls will call them a quitter. But we have to think about a rational and, and human empowering way of thinking about quitting. And that's why I had a chapter called uh, the subversive power of quitting because it should be a tool in the kit of the uh, in the kit of the late bloomer that quitting is sometimes acceptable i am not saying people's first response to any adversity should be to quit that would be bad but i knew people would think that a little bit that's why i said the subversive uh, the subversive quality of quitting. I like it. And I think there is, as you describe it, a danger with determination. There's a point at which hitting your head against the wall, maybe it's because you're not supposed to go through that wall. There's another path for you. There's another path or another way to do it. Um, since we're both uh, veterans of endurance sports, um, I was always uh, infatuated with uh, the, the, the renowned track and field coach when I was... Mm -hmm. Running in, uh, running in the 70s. And it was Bill Bowerman at the University of Oregon. And Bill Bowerman is legendary for walking away against this idea that you should subject your runners to the most training possible that they could absorb. And some would burn out and some would break through and do better. And he thought that every runner uh, works best on a cycle of training of hard, easy. Thanks. Hard one day easy in recovery the next. Some runners could take two hard days and one easy and would prosper. Some runners needed one hard day and then rest for two days. The great runner who still lives today in, uh, in Boulder, Frank Shorter, who won yep. the Olympic marathon in 1972, gave himself two brutally hard interval workouts per week and then ran a lot of mileage. He ran up to 140 miles a week training for the Munich Olympics. And he said 80% of the miles that he ran you know, a, a reasonably fit jogger could keep up with them. And so how you think about how you're going to portion your grit and talent out there, marry your, your talent to your grit. And if you're, you, you can waste your grit mm -hmm. if you're applying it to other people's expectations. How do you know when you're blooming? You know when you're blooming when instead of being pushed, you feel like you're being pulled to some destiny. You know, it's almost a beautiful power that you're being pulled wow, my deepest talents, my deepest sense of purpose, it's over there, I'm feeling pulled. 
then the grit and the courage that you need will be supplied to you. I know that sounds metaphysical, but every anecdotal story that I, uh, that I write about in the book and psychology seems to support that idea. Save your grit for the things that really matter. I'm going to say it's at those points you're in alignment. When you're in alignment, it no longer feels like you're pushing to go up the mountain, even though you may be. Well, look, at a lot of late bloomers are late bloomers because they're introverts. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're shy. And if you're going to bloom, at some point you're going to have to be an evangelist for, for something. Yeah. A, a movement that you've gotten behind, a company that you've created. You're going to have to be, to put it starkly, a salesman. Well, how do you sell? If you've never been a salesman, you don't like the word even, uh, you're shy or introverted. Well, if you're feeling, feeling like you're being pulled toward your destiny, magically you will learn how to do that. Yeah. You will learn, trust me, you will learn how to do that because I learned how to do that. And I couldn't sell my way out of a paper bag during all those little fundraisers, yeah. you know, in junior high school and, and high school. So let's go from, from sell your way out of a paper bag to you mentioned a word a minute ago, beautiful power. And I want to talk about one of the most important, as you call it, superpowers that late bloomers are experiencing and they, they can't quite read it right. The superpower that is self-doubt. Well, the first thing you have to do, Michael, because everybody feels self-doubt, and self-doubt is like a cloud that covers up the sun. It always shows up at the most inconvenient moment. The first thing you have to do is wall it off from your self-worth. And that's why it's so important to have that sense of supreme destiny. It can be a belief in God. It can be a belief in um, a higher power. It can be a belief in the force. Yeah. Uh, I really think it's advantageous to have a belief like that, that you're here for a purpose, because then it just makes it a little easier to wall off self-doubt with your inherent self-worth. So number one, do that. Don't ever let self-doubt infect your self-worth. You are a worthy person. Then you look at self-doubt as information. It simply shows up as information. Carol Dweck said, look on it like an annoying friend. They show up at the worst possible time to deliver information that you didn't want to hear at that time. She suggests listening to the doubt like you would the annoying friend, thanking the annoying friend, and say, now go sit down. You told me what you needed to tell me. And then you look at self-doubt clinically. You step away from it. Again, it's not your self-worth. You step away from it. And you look at it. Well, what is self-doubt trying to tell me right now? Uh, maybe it's telling me I haven't prepared. Maybe it's telling me I need, to, I need to partner with somebody who's got complementary skills with me. And then we would be a real powerful force together. It could be many, any number of things. Maybe I'm not getting enough sleep or meditation. Listen to it. What is, it's telling you something valuable. And then learn from that something valuable. And then the last thing about self-doubt, and it's a whole category, but uh, learn self-efficacy. And self-efficacy is start with the thing you know you can do, even if you're feeling self-doubt. And build the little wins out from there. And that's how you proceed and get bigger than yourself, even with self-doubt. Uh, Meryl Streep, uh, the actress, says she feels self-doubt all the time. All the time. My Angelo, um, Angelou says that with all the books she's written, she's always has this feeling of doubt that somebody someday is going to discover, as she put it, somebody that I'm playing a game on people. Yeah. Imposter it shows syndrome. up. It shows up with successful people. Forget about it. Take it as useful information. Don't ever, ever let it infect your self worth. And now you've got a, a way of thinking about self doubt that can be highly useful because the people who try to bluster their way through self doubt by puffing them, throwing their shoulders back and puffing up their confidence and fake it till you make it. That's, that's a short-term fix. It's a short-term fix. It doesn't last. Well, you just brought up another superpower that I think you're going to need another, another chapter on in a, in a future book or in, a, in a, uh, an even better, this is an amazing book, everybody go out, get late bloomers. But, it, it, but in another version of this book, the superpower of awareness, because as we're, in, and it goes along with insight, as we're gaining wisdom, as we're gaining an ability to step back and look at things, that becomes a tremendous power for us. Yeah, there are a lot of psychological studies out there that self-talk is really important. And self-talk where you refer to yourself in the third person rather than the first person. So you can say to yourself, uh, uh, if you're 
if you've got a bit of self-doubt around something, what is Michael feeling? What is Michael thinking? Why is Michael feeling this way? And that opens up your peripheral vision and gives you better awareness. When I was learning how to fly, I watched these videos from a husband and wife team, Martha and John King, who make these great video, video instructionals about how to fly. And I learned from them that self-talk, when you're learning to fly, you create situational awareness. And when I took uh, the test for my private pilot's license, mm -hmm. the examiner was impressed by the fact that I was talking everything through. I'm pulling out the uh, the pull, pulling back on the power. I'm lowering the first degree of flaps. I'm beginning to bank into a 20 degree turn. Talking through everything, situational awareness is everything. Uh, particularly if you feel a little bit of nervousness or panic about something, you feeling nervous about giving a speech reframe it as I'm feeling excited about giving this speech. Situational awareness. This speech, a lot of adrenaline is coursing through me here. I feel blessed that that is happening. And I'm going to learn something from this speech, even if it's not the perfect speech, because this isn't the last speech I'm going to give. Beautiful. Can you tell us, what would you say are the top three tips you want to give people for becoming a late bloomer? Get off the conveyor belt. Uh, that society has created that says if you haven't achieved early and big, that you're always going to be a second rate citizen, get off that conveyor belt, get your kids off that conveyor belt if you're a parent. I would say going back to self doubt, accept self doubt as naturally occurring, as useful information, yeah. but put a wall that shall never be breached between your inherent self worth as a human being and the momentary bouts of self-doubt that you may have. Use that self-doubt as a tool. And then I would say curiosity. Feed your curiosity. Develop your curiosity. Trust your curiosity. It is the gift that keeps on giving. It is the dopamine hit that will give you more than will take from you. And uh, if you do those things, at least maybe you might be in the right, right quadrant uh, for blooming not only later but multiple times. And and thanks for recommending the book. You'll get even to a narrow slice where your odds of blooming will get, get even better. Woohoo! On that note, where can people go to find out more and to find your beautiful book? Well, you can, uh, you can go to Amazon and get it. Mm -hmm. I encourage people to go to Goodreads because yep. the, the reviews on Goodreads are by people who've really read the book and are not bringing another agenda. They tend to be higher quality. So check it out on Goodreads. Um, I'm a big believer in local bookstores. So if you have a favorite local bookstore, uh, go there. But of course, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and uh, the usual sources. And do you have a website you want to send people to? Well, I have two. I have uh, I have my uh, richcarlgard.com, mm -hmm. and then I have a specific site for the book, Late Bloomer, single, not plural, latebloomer.com. And so that is Rich Carlgard. if I'm spelling this right, R-I-C-H-K-A-R-L-G-A-A-R-D.com and LateBloomer.com. Correct. Awesome. Couple last questions. First off, what can you tell us about Geraldine Weiss, also known as G. Weiss? Geraldine Weiss, uh, if you were to have a Hall of Fame of the most successful women investors in history, it would be Geraldine Weiss, who's 92 or three years old right now. Uh, she went by G Weiss when she was just starting out. First of all, she didn't even, you know, she didn't have the money or the confidence to start her investing newsletter yep. until she was in her forties, but she did. And, uh, for the longest time she signed at G Weiss, uh, because there, there was a, a bias against women investors. There was a bias, uh, there was an anti-Semitism that, that, uh, made it hard for her to get a job at an investment bank too that really didn't begin to go away in the world of finance until the 1960s. And she came of age older than that. It's why Benjamin Graham did not let Warren Buffett into his firm, even though Buffett was his best student. He said to Warren Buffett, you know, I need to make room for the people who, for whom, you know, they, they can't get jobs at other investment banks. But she, she had this theory that, you know, you looked at dividends, uh, uh, quality companies, but, and it became very, very successful. Uh, and she did. She shocked everybody when she went on Wall Street Week, a show that PBS used to have. And there, suddenly, G. Weiss was a woman, and uh, and that's when she came out of the uh, the Geraldine closet. Very, very cool. Tremendous late bloomer. So uh, I was going to ask just last words of wisdom, but I can't. My wife is in my head right now, and she's <laughs> saying I have got to ask, 
what advice would you give parents to help their kids today? Love your kids. Listen to them. Be there for them. Really listen between the lines to discover what they might be passionate about, what they might be anxious about. Look, if you have a kid as an early achiever, that I'm all for you. Blessings. If they're not an early achiever, plan B is don't double down on the conveyor belt. Don't double down on the discipline and the tutors. Think about getting off the early bloomer track. My book will supply a lot of information about why you need to do that. And there are multiple paths to blooming. Early achievers can bloom, middle achievers, late bloomers, and we can bloom many times. I think that's what we're all looking for is not once, but many times. Woohoo! This has been phenomenal, Rich. Any last Thank you, words? Michael. Man, this has been great. We could keep going and going and going. I am. I love this book. I support you so much. Everybody, go out and get it. Here, I can't say that strongly enough. Any last words of wisdom you want to share with people today, Rich? You're a divine creature. You have a divine destiny. Destiny wants you to bloom. Woohoo! <laughs> thank you so, so much, Rich. Well, thank you, Michael. This is really great. This is really great. I, I'm so you're terrific. You're, you're a terrific interview. Thank you. It's um, I've so greatly enjoyed this. So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get late bloomers, and begin discovering the power of your late blooming today and shine bright. Woohoo! Thank you so much, Rich. Thanks. That was great. So I'm so glad you enjoyed it. So, so glad you did. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also leave your comments, have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're gonna get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>